Before I comment on today's Gospel reading, just a, a reminder, we have our movie night this coming Saturday at 7 p.m. We are continuing with the, uh, the series The Chosen, and we will be starting season two this coming Saturday. That's at 7 p.m. Also, next Saturday, October the 16th, we will have a public rosary rally just outside of our church at 12 noon, so hopefully you can join us for both of these events. In regards to today's gospel reading, the, the gospel is really about the importance of unity and the detrimental consequences of being divided. And so no one in their right mind would want to be divided or to have their kingdom divided. And our Lord points out that this applies even to Satan and his kingdom. Now, in the, in the kingdom of Satan, you know, each of the fallen angels is filled with, with great pride and great hatred for God. It's not as if they like each other, but insofar as they want to oppose God and God's plan for mankind, they are extremely united. And in fact, we hear various cases in, in the scriptures that, you know, out of Mary Magdalene, seven demons were cast out. In other words, those seven united in possessing her. Or if you recall the, the man who was possessed amongst the tombs, uh, the, the Gadarenes, when, when the, the demons uh, are cast or they go into the swine, and, and it was, they, uh, they reveal themselves as being legion, which is like, I, I think it's a thousand foot soldiers you know, of, of an army. In other words, it's a very large amount of demons possessing one man. So the demons are definitely, definitely united in this. Notice also in today's gospel reading when he points out that an unclean spirit, when it goes out of a person, it wanders uh, through waterless regions looking for a resting place, but not finding any. It says, I will, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So once again, it re reiterates how they're united and they want to have greater control, greater possession of human beings. So the one demon invites seven others to come and possess that. And part of the, the lesson there is that sometimes, especially for people who know what is right and wrong, you know, young, young people, when they fall into sin, okay, well, they're, they're led astray by their peers. Maybe they didn't know certain things were really that wrong, and they're just kind of believing the media. But once someone knows and they fall into sin and again and again, in other words, the evil spirits have greater access to them because their sin is all the more greater than someone who falls out of ignorance, let's say. So all the more reason as to why we should avoid falling into sin. Now, when we think of the Catholic Church, Satan wants to destroy, to corrupt the Catholic Church. And of course, he's intent on doing this, and he does this by means of the human beings in the world. So the church has been constantly attacked from without, but in many ways being attacked from within. We see this even in the apostles, amongst the apostles themselves. If you recall, Satan entered into Judas when he commits to betraying our Lord at the Last Supper. So Satan definitely wants to destroy the Catholic Church, he wants to destroy Catholics to drag them down into hell. So when we look at the history of the church, there have been divisions from day one, even amongst the apostles. Who is the greatest among you? Or who, they argued who is the greatest among themselves, right? So all these divisions, St. Paul addresses certain divisions or certain wrong practices, wrong beliefs, even in the early church. And then as time goes on, you know, for example, with Arianism in the early 300s, there was a major division in the church between the Arian bishops and the more traditional-minded bishops. And eventually that was resolved. The first main split occurred sometime in the, in the 900s between the Orthodox and, and the Roman rites, so between Rome and Constantinople. 
And it was only after uh, sometime in the 1500s with the Protestant Reformation, you know, they, they, they split off from the church at that point. And it's really from Protestantism that we get all these other different denominations, the 30,000 um, that exist today. That's, that's what some people estimate, that there's 30,000 different Christian denominations. So most of these come from Protestantism. It is true that even within the Catholic Church today, we do have divisions. So there are some who are extremely progressive and they want to change what Jesus taught. They want to change morality. They want to change the definition of, of marriage and so many other things. And then there are those who reject papal authority or reject the Second Vatican Council and, and they're just ultra conservative and, and, and they, they, some, some of these even reject uh, that there is a valid pope. Uh, they're referred to as sede vacantis, so the seat is vacant, the seat of Rome, the seat of the, the Pope is vacant, you know. So the, these are kind of extreme divisions, but even within the main body of the Catholic Church or Catholic believers, yeah, there are, there are kind of differences of opinion, different viewpoints, and I think it's also true to say that many Catholics simply don't know their faith. So sometimes when they might be challenged, they may actually end up being on the wrong side of the argument. And this is why it's so important for us to know our faith and morality. Now, when we consider why did these divisions occur in the church? And often it's kind of intellectual arguments or intellectual beliefs. So with Arianism, Arian taught that Christ was not divine, that he was just the greatest created being. And yes, he's our savior. Yes, he did all these miracles and everything, but he's not one of the persons of the Trinity. This is what Arian taught, and many people believed it. So it was an intellectual argument. The same with Protestantism. You know, Martin Luther, he looked at the church at that time, and there was a lot of corruption in the church at that time. You know, priests were living with women, they were selling indulgences and all kinds of corruption. And Martin Luther said, this can't be the true church. You know, it's interesting at that time in the 1500s, we have some of the greatest saints coming or that existed from the 1500s, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Philip Neri, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and there's so many others from that time period. And that just goes to show that whenever there is a crisis, God raises up saints to lead people back to the ways of God. So yes, there was corruption at that time, but there were these intellectual arguments and the problem with these intellectual arguments is sometimes they sound right, they sound correct, they sound convincing, but they may be wrong. And so we need to know the truth. And this is why God established a church with an infallible authority. So when we look at the constant teaching of the church, we know what the truth is. When we look at the official teachings of the church, we know what the truth is. And we have to submit our intellectual capabilities to the authority of the church. Does this mean that you cannot question anything? No. So sometimes people have questions. They wonder, well, why is it wrong to practice artificial contraception, for example? Or why is this the case? Or why is that the case? So. You know, St. Augustine says, faith seeking understanding. So we have to submit to the authority of God, which comes to us through the authority of the church. Remember how Christ says, those who listen to you, listen to me. So we're talking about the official teaching now. So we have to submit to that. So really, what's behind all of this? And, you know, just like I mentioned on Sunday, what's behind all the problems with divisions in, in marriage or divorce? You know, it's interesting. Satan doesn't just want Christians divided. He also wants societies divided, parishes divided, families divided, because divide and conquer. It's a very common principle that people in the military understand, right? So if you want to conquer someone, divide them, separate them, isolate them. When we're left to ourselves, we're much, much weaker. This is why one of the benefits of coming to church on Sundays is that you're in the midst of the believing community. Simply seeing others practicing their faith strengthens your faith. If you're just practicing your faith at home, well, 
what's to strengthen your faith? It's your own personal devotion, but you don't have the benefit of people, like-minded people, practicing your faith. So they want to isolate people. They want them just to believe what the media wants or, or Satan wants us to be divided. And also when we're divided, there's often the element of anger, hatred, resentment. These are openings to the evil spirits. They love it when we give in to these things. So there's nothing wrong with having differences of opinion. But we have to discuss those things rationally. Now notice what happens in today's gospel reading. Our Lord is accused of casting out demons by the prince of demons or the ruler of the demons. He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. So in other words, they're concerned because our Lord is gaining a, a large following. And they don't like that. They don't agree intellectually with the things our Lord is teaching. And so they start attacking his human uh, person. In other words, they're using ad hominem arguments. That's a Latin phrase, ad hominem, against the man. In other words, they're not debating theology or saying you're wrong because of this, you're wrong because of that. In other words, now they're accusing his person. Well, he's possessed. He's casting out these demons by the prince of the demons, the ruler of the demons. And this is often how people deal with, with others when things don't go their way. They realize they can't argue rationally, so they just attack the person, try to damage their character, which, which of course is wrong. It's, it's, it's evil. So this is partially what they're doing. Now, someone might argue that, well, they have rational grounds for it, and in one sense, yes, but they're not willing to listen to reason. And this is why our Lord, notice how he responds. He responds very reasonably. A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Even the kingdom of Satan is not divided. And recall how our Lord, you know, just before he undergoes his passion and death, the one thing he prayed for was unity amongst his followers. Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Now think about this division this desire of Satan and the evil spirits to divide and conquer. This division that takes place in the church, in society, or even within families, as I mentioned, it's ultimately related to our pride, thinking we know what's right, just like Arius, he thought he was right, and he clung to what he believed was right. In other words, he believed more in his own intellectual abilities than the God-given authority of the church. So pride, so sin is, is at the root of it. But if you think about it, sin is a separation from God. So it's a division. But even within ourselves, there's a division that takes place. So in other words, these, um, let, let's just say the Jewish leaders, they're accusing our Lord of casting out demons by the, the prince of demons. You see, they cannot rationally argue against our Lord. So they are, they are denying right reason and they are just clinging to their will. We want this man out of here. We want this man's influence to stop. So they suppress their reason. So even when our Lord tries to explain things reasonably to them, they refuse to listen. We see the same thing happening today. I mean, an extreme example we could say is, is when someone has an abortion. Now, some people acknowledge that it was wrong, but they were pressured and, you know, okay, they, they, they may have repented of it. But, but we see so many people who say, well, no, it, it's my body, it's my choice. Is it really your body? I mean, it has its own genetic makeup. The child in your room has its totally unique genetic makeup. Sometimes it even has different blood type than the mother. And you say it's your own body? Well, yes, it's within your body, but it's not your own body. And, and, and some will refuse to acknowledge that it's even a child. Oh, it's just a, plumb, a, a blob of tissue or something. And they get so angry when we tell them that it's a human being, that it's a human life. Why are they so angry? Because they don't want to acknowledge the truth. They're suppressing their conscience. They're suppressing their reason. So what's happening? There's a division between their right reason, logic, and their will. They don't want it to be true. 
Therefore, they suppress their own reason. And if you suppress your own reason, you're going to have problems in other areas of your life. It makes perfect sense. So when we consider the, the human being and, and in our soul, reason should be at the top. The will or our desires should be in the middle and our actions follow. In other words, our passions, our bodies carry out the actions that we should do. You know, this division that takes place, is a typical example that many people can relate to is, you know, especially if you have to go to work and let's say it's, it's the middle of the winter, it's still dark outside and you went to bed late and you're tired and your alarm clock goes off and it's cold in your room. You don't want to get out of bed. Your will is saying no, 10 more minutes. But reason should be telling you this is the time to wake up. And if you don't listen to your reason, well, what's going to happen? You end up hitting the snooze button. But by, by doing that, you're training your will to dominate your intellect. And so when you have other desires, other passions, you just give in because you're in the habit of giving in. You're not acting according to right reason. And so when temptation comes along, well, you can't resist because you don't have the strength of will to resist. Even though you know it's wrong, you can't help but giving in because you've programmed yourself to do that. This is why many saints say that, you know, the, the first thing that you do in the morning is you should wake up right away when, when it's time to wake up. And they say that that's the heroic moment. And that will set the, the tone for the rest of your day. So if we practice self-denial at the very beginning, it makes it easier throughout the day. In other words, reason, right reason, should always dominate. So when it comes to someone like Arius, right, he he willed or he chose to believe in his own intellectual capabilities more so than to believe in the authority of God or the God-given authority of the church. And this is what led to his downfall. Now, in the case of these, these uh, Jewish leaders, they start out by calling our Lord names and, you know, accusing him of breaking the Sabbath, of, you know, his disciples eat without washing their hands and so many other things, right? They accuse him of all these things. So they're, they're attacking the person. But what does it end up in? Asking for his death, his murder. So in other words, when we start suppressing right reason, we eventually become capable even of murder. Think about it. And you think, oh, that would never happen to me. Well, these people were very religious-minded, but their hatred, their opposition to our Lord, eventually led for their desire to murder a man, and in this case, the most holy man ever, Jesus Christ, God incarnate. But, you know, even if it was just an ordinary man, murder is wrong. But this is where sin can lead. This is why the seven deadly sins are so dangerous, because if we don't make the effort to, to fight against them, they will definitely lead us into mortal sin. So we need to be united. We need to know our faith. We need to be united as Catholics. Ideally, we, un we need to unite with all Christians, and we need to fight injustice. In other words, not just injustice in society, but the evil spirits who are behind all the injustice. So imagine if all of us are truly united. And, you know, the, the other thing is that when it comes to the practice of our faith, Unless we know the fullness of the truth, we don't have that proper relationship with God that we should have. You know, if Arius believes that Jesus is not really God, but just the greatest created being, he's not going to be praying to Jesus. He's not going to be adoring Jesus. He's not going to believe that God is coming into him in Holy Communion. You see how it, affects, it would affect his faith? So in other words, we have to have the right understanding of everything that God reveals. And so we have to submit to the authority of the church, the authority of God. We have to humble ourselves before the truth. And we also need to be united within ourselves. Right reason ought to dominate. <laughs>